Have you ever had a dream where you find yourself on a stage and you realize you don't know your lines? What do you do? Well, for me, this was real. But after an epic road trip through the heart of Georgia's music scene, I was ready for it. Because along the way, we learned about crowd surfing from a violin virtuoso, met the children of an American icon, we felt the spirit of Dwayne Allman in the big house. There were knives, there were grits, there was rock and roll. This is Music Voyager. Trust the locals. You got one, man, a tree branch right there. <laughs> Play with fire. <laughs> Never turn down a good meal. Helena. Because if you let one thing lead to another, ah. the voyage ah. never ends. Life is good right now. Funding for Music Voyager provided in part by Celebrating Culture, Encouraging Communication, Create for Change, a nonprofit for bridging cultures through film. Look, listen, learn. Music Voyager is made possible through the support of these organizations. Athens, Georgia is a college town. Conceived and built from its inception as a center of culture and learning, it's home to the University of Georgia Bulldogs. And these days, it's consistently ranked as one of the best music towns in all of America. To find out why, we start by meeting up with the Athens-born rock band, The Wigs. What do you think it is about Athens that kind of lends itself to you know, this sort of creativity? I know it's got a historic music scene, but what did it do for you guys? I think, you know, there's lots of places for bands to play. There's lots of horrors in town, and uh, it's easy to get some stage time. Places like the 40 Watt, you know, always there. It's my favorite place to hang out. Like so many other nights, the Wigs are headed to the 40 Watt tonight, a welcome homecoming after nonstop touring. You guys need a sax player? We don't need a sax player. <laughs> <laughs> Riding around with Parker from the Wigs in Athens, it becomes clear that there is a bar or music venue on pretty much every corner. We're going to buy some classic spots here. Coming up here on our right is Georgia Bar. That's probably the bar that I've spent the most time in. Going down to the 40 watt. Here's where we're playing tonight. Look at us on the marquee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even for a band that's played the Late Show and toured around the world, Playing this venue in this town just means something extra. I kind of get anxiety playing at home because we've played for a lot of these people for such a long time. It's like I always just want to put on our best show to date for Athens. Parker was right. They don't need a saxophone. The wigs work just fine as three pieces. The next morning, the Wigs point me to one of Athens' most well-respected restaurants. The music scene in Athens and the food scene have always been closely intertwined. It's just part of life here. The National also seems to have become part of life here by fusing Southern and Mediterranean food and serving it up in what used to be the garage of a tire recapping plant. Executive chef Peter Dale keeps the menu fresh. I see a whole lot of shrimp here. Yeah. What's going on? We're only four hours from the coast, and one of our buddies, Dan, goes down, uh, meets the shrimp boats in the middle of the night, fills up coolers for us, and then they're back here uh, in time for lunch. So um, we're peeling fresh wow. Georgia shrimp. We're doing uh, our play on a shrimp and grits. And then because we are a little Mediterranean, we'll do some Spanish chorizo in there. Uh, so it's a sort of a Mediterranean spin on a southern classic. Sounds delicious. Yeah, but perfect for a cool day. <laughs> wow. The shrimp, you can just taste how fresh it is. The grits as well, they're really finely ground. Yeah, yeah, really they're creamy. Really creamy, really nice, and I can taste the chorizo like oil in there. You guys gotta get in here. 
you know, I, I wish I could just feed it to you, really. I really wish I could. Oh, sorry. Peter's obsession with all things local leads to delicious food, but he takes his obsession one step further. Even his kitchen knives are locally sourced. Which is why I'm now in a shed in the middle of the woods surrounded by some bearded guys wearing leather aprons holding massive razor sharp blades. Peter wants to buy one. How does that kind of feel? Wow, that's cool. Luke and David at Bloodroot Blades create the coolest looking knives. And we make one off pieces. That satisfy the rigors of the busiest restaurant kitchen and serve as keepsakes by incorporating materials, like scraps of cloth, that have specific meaning to each knife's owner. It's, it's really hard to keep a scrap of your grandma's quilt or something around, but it's, it's real easy in terms of a knife. People use it every day, so it's sort of the perfect combination of nostalgia and pragmatism. Yeah, it was in a sense like a, it's like a practical heirloom, or like a right. practical sort of memory artifact. It's kind of weird to find that these days. Okay, quick review. Peter makes local dishes using local ingredients, using locally made knives that are created using local materials. I feel like I'm in the Middle Ages or something. And what does this have to do with music again? I came from a musical background. I have a degree in, in cello performance, actually. My motion on this grinder, when I'm pulling a knife across it, is a lot the same as me pulling a bow across a string. And if you hang around Bloodroot Blades long enough, you start to hear actual music in their work. It's something you can just get lost in. Okay, that got weird. I need a drink. Musical voyage, take one. Fantastic. What's this thing? That is the Rosemary Beach, Florida, with a rosemary simple syrup, uh, gin, and a full grapefruit. Ah, tasty. Yeah. This you is actually awesome. like it. I actually like it. I actually like it, yeah. This is singer, composer, and violinist Kishibashi, who recently moved to Athens and has invited me to his favorite bar. I have a lot of friends who actually work here. It's the first sense of like kind of community that I got, and it's not just like a bar. They have like fresh squeezed grapefruits and like a pretty cool menu that's just like what you want to eat, not necessarily what you should eat. <laughs> this place and you know, the Nationals are kind of along the same vein. Yeah, Farm to table. Uh, yeah, the food culture here is like extremely high. Kishibashi's friends call him Kei. He invites me to his house where he's got a new home studio out back. So what about the town did you fall in love with? For the small town that it is, that it's got this really vibrant music culture and there's professionals here that I work with all the time. Ironically, Kay doesn't even need other musicians to create a room full of music using just his voice, his violin, and some other effects pedals. a violinist, how to play at rock and roll venues. I like standing like really close, like crowds that I can like crowd surf and stuff. Hold on, but, hold on. You crowd surfed? Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a whole tour where I did all crowd surf tour. Oh God. It's uh, it's really easy. You say, hey, I'm gonna take a picture, and then they all kind of come up, and then you're like, psych, <laughs> and now I'm on you, you know. Your music is dancey, but it has some, a lot of emotion in it, you know, with your singing and just some of those like long, sweeping, kind of dreamlike movements in them. And it's really nice to listen to. Kay's move to Athens has given him the space to spread out that he never had in New York City. But it's also kept him connected to his musical community both fellow musicians and great venues, such as the recently rebuilt Georgia Theater. It's a historic music hall that tragically caught on fire a few years back. It's crazy, you can see like the charboard, like wood slab that's hanging over an old doorway. Yeah, sounds delicious. <laughs> a few blocks away is another large music hall, the Classic Center. 
which tonight hosts one of the country's hottest touring bluegrass bands, Old Crow Medicine Show. was a great music town, but seeing it firsthand has blown me away. But a music scene like this doesn't happen overnight, so what's the deal? How did this all start? Folk music historian Art Rosenbaum offers some clues, and a song. Here in uh, Athens and almost any other southern town, there were vernacular musicians who might play at a house party or a fish fry or a square dance and not have aspirations of, of becoming part of what we now call the music industry or the music business. They made music for family and community. People around you treat me like a dirty dog. Oh, people around you treat me like a dirty dog. Make me sleep down in the hollow log. Art's connection to the Special Collections Library at the University of Georgia leads to another clue. Apparently, by the 1970s, there was a new kind of vernacular musician in Athens, the art school party kid. Michael LaHusky was one of those kids. 1979, it was pretty much the old south, and on campus, there was a really vibrant scene at the art school. There wasn't much to do, so we kind of made our own scene. From this party scene sprang a little band called the B-52s, whose beehives and campy dance rock propelled them into the national spotlight. We kind of came in a little bit after the B-52s because they hit it big with their first single and they just took off and moved to New York. Our band Pylon kind of filled the void there. We are really known for kind of minimalism and a particular kind of beat that ended up being very danceable. When R.E.M. joined this growing musical movement and became one of the biggest bands in the world, Athens was pushed into another musical stratosphere. R.E.M., to their credit, they got real big. They stayed here. So, you know, Athens started turning into something starting around that time that Pylon broke up around 1984. Just as I'm starting to feel like I understand the Athens music scene, Michael shows me something that changes everything. What? Did you <laughs> see this? What is this place? Somewhere in here, they're, they're keeping up with like Georgia music history, including my band, Pylon. Yeah. Well, if my music ever got into some sort of archive, I'd be completely humbled and... Uh, and myself. old. <laughs> <laughs> Wandering around these massive vaults, I can feel the weight of Georgia's rich music history. And I'm realizing that to understand music around here, I have to see cities like Macon, where Otis Redding, Little Richard, and the Allman Brothers exploded onto the world stage. How could so much influential music have sprung up in one place like that? I gotta hit the road and find out. Need some peanuts? I mean, that's why we stopped. So how did ball peanuts even start? I have no idea. It's just like a bean, a salted bean. You can make a dip out of this bean, you'd be banging. Arriving in Macon, you can feel life slowing down, just a bit. It's a quaint little town full of classic, large southern homes and churches. I want to find out why this town has nurtured so many fine musicians over the years, and I think I've got the right guy to show me. Hey! hey. Good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. You're totally my hair twin. I nice say man. This is ridiculous. This guy, Roger Riddle, is a local music journalist and DJ. We meet up in an old soul food joint in the middle of town. And this was the place where the Almond Brothers used to hang out and eat, man. Really? Mama Louise. She would feed them. And as the story goes, the guys sat down, the whole band came in one day, and they ordered two plates of food for like six guys. And 
Mama Louise was like, oh, we can't have that. So she fed the whole band. And whenever they got hungry, they would come here. She would feed them. They would go off. They would do their show, make enough money, come back and pay for the food they ate. That's so great. And years down the road, they showed how much they appreciated it when they took her on tour with them to be their personal caterer. Seriously? Yes. If you want to get the true H&H &H experience, you got to have a fried chicken. You're speaking my language right now. Fried chicken is my language. Let's do this. Right on. You gotta try the macaroni and cheese. The collard greens are good. The succotash, you can't go wrong. In fact, you just can't go wrong. You just can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. I love a place where you can't go wrong. I'm gonna take a five minute break. <laughs> Incredibly, Mama Louise is now in her mid 80s. Hey, Mama Louise, do you mind if we join you? Yep, chef, dog. Thank you. And is still at the restaurant almost every day, making sure that its new owners keep using many of the recipes that she's refined in her 70 years of cooking. This is happening right now. This is very typical of what a meal is like if you're at home with your family and make it. I'm gonna try the succotash. Oh, yeah. It's lima beans, corn, corn. tomato, all, all um, stewed together. Mm. Yes. A, little, a little onion in there. A little too. onion in there? Well, that's some special season. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you can't even tell me, you have to kill me, right? Kind right, of right, exactly, right. right. <laughs> Mom, Mama said. Louise told us how to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge of cooking. The Almond Brothers didn't just eat in Macon, they lived here. In this house, specifically. The reason it's called the Big House is because it was the biggest house they'd ever seen in 1970. As the base of operations for the Almond Brothers from 1970 to 73, the Big House was the launch pad for the band's rapid ascent to fame. This is where they sat, listened to music, played a little bit of music, chatted, and got to be, you know, just normal human artists. Did they do a little uh, something else? You too? know, there may have been a little partying going on. Uh, you know, there's a seven head shower. Some people got clean in the shower. Some people may have gotten dirty in the shower. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a special place. Now a museum, the big house tells the story of a band on the way up, but also that of a tightly knit group of people whose closeness would soon be tested. And one of our prized possessions is this beautiful gold top Les Paul that was Dwayne Allman's. Dwayne Allman was famous for his silky, smooth lead slide, a sound that helped launch Southern rock as a commercial genre. Rolling Stone has even named him the second greatest guitar player of all time, behind only Jimi Hendrix. But Dwayne tragically died in a motorcycle crash in Macon just two years after forming the band with his younger brother, Greg. Guitarist J.D. Simo pays homage on the very gold top Dwayne played. One of Megan's other great musical icons also passed away far too young. Otis Redding was killed in a plane crash at the age of 26. But his children live on, keeping the family name and foundation alive and well. I know that when Papa Otis passed away, you guys were pretty young, but what kind of person do you get a sense that he was? Very loving, very caring. He let the kids get away with everything. <laughs> I was so young, I was only three. And was buried on my fourth birthday, so I really wasn't aware very much of what was going on. And Education was very important to him, mm -hmm. and we know that that's what he would be doing today if he were still alive. He would not only be doing the great music that he, that he did, but he'd really be pushing education um, and music and arts programs in his community and beyond. What about Macon do you think drew this soul singer out of him? You know, Macon is known for having a lot of churches. And you know, and my father um, sang in the church, came from a very, very religious family. And I'm sure that that had to have a lot to do with pulling, you know, putting a lot of soul into him because there's definitely soul in the church. Otis III not only honors his father's legacy, 
but he followed in his dad's rather large footsteps. He and his brother Dexter formed a funk band called The Reddings in the early 80s. I couldn't help but notice that there's this Rolling Stone cover. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of like about children of big stars. And what did you experience, you know, maybe in terms of a shadow or, you know? Well, most definitely I had to, to learn to live with it. Um, in the, the early years, it was, um, it was a lot easier because people looked at us as, oh, those are Otis's kids, and let's take a listen to that. That should be fun. And after the six albums and the, the hits were over, it gave me an opportunity and, and a chance to, to really get into the roots of soul music, the roots of my dad's catalog. I'm happy doing what I do, but I can't really fill those shoes. There's only one Otis Redding, you know, so but I, I respect the king of soul. <laughs> Fair enough, man. I respect him so much, too, and his beautiful music. The time Otis has spent with his dad's catalog comes through in a song of his own called Leaving Me. Talking about leaving me. Talking about leaving me. I don't know where you're gonna go. I got my bags back, baby. I'm going with you. It's a cocoa world living out here all alone. Sun don't shine the same out here on my own. And I don't wanna go back to the way it used to be. Oh, so long ago, before you was here with me, talking about leaving me. Actually. My father passed away when I was about two. And I can totally relate to kind of, you know, just that side. Not my father was not Otis Redding by any means, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, like he was a musician and he did leave some music. And there's something amazing about going through that. So that's know. where you get the talent from. I heard you. Huh? you get, this guy gives me a CD. I didn't know what to expect. Having touched the echoes of Megan's past, I want to see what's happening right now in Megan. So I meet back up with Roger Riddle downtown. I'm from New York, play saxophone. What do you think a place like Macon has to offer for me? The support. If you were to come to Macon, I bet you every band would let you play with them. Really? I, I'm sure of it. They push your music just like they push everybody else's music. I think you get along with the other bands and the people here, they're full of flavor, they're just like you. Macon's supportive atmosphere has apparently allowed music of all types to flourish. Right in this very coffee shop, there is a growing singer-songwriter scene fueled by the Reading Foundation's Songwriting Summer Camp. Classical music has a world-class home at Mercer University's McDuffie Center for Strings. The level of the facilities and the quality of the musicianship we find at Mercer is really impressive. And behind the scenes in Macon, connecting all the local music, is Roger Riddle. I infiltrated the newspaper so that I could write about my friends and the up and coming bands. So when no one would write about us when we were doing it, now they had someone on the inside. It's like, tell me, nice. tell me when your shows are. So that's how I got connected with everybody. I know a little bit of everything that's happening in town because everybody knows that I can help put them out somewhere. And tonight is no exception. Roger's putting on a show at the Cox Capitol Theater featuring two of Macon's up and coming acts. Back City Woods is a bluegrass band that has the energy of a punk show. Whoa. Widow Pills is kind of an alt country band. So I'm heading back down to Georgia. And they're one of the newer bands that have made a big splash here in town. And I got women on my mind. And I want to make a little love. I want to dream. It's exciting to be able to take somebody from out of town and say, hey, this is what we've got going on. 
And what's exciting for me is that the bands here tonight do exactly what Roger predicted they would. Before long, I find myself invited on stage, playing country music to a crowd that knows good music of all kinds. Here in Macon, they've experienced a music history that rivals any town in America. And they've supported their music in the churches, through their food, through the legacy of their biggest stars, and through an overall commitment to music education. Feeling all that support as an outsider makes this experience on stage a dream. Not the scary kind of anxiety dream, but an amazing dream that I won't soon forget. Funding for Music Voyager provided in part by Celebrating Culture Encouraging Communication Create for Change A nonprofit for bridging cultures through film Look, listen, learn Music Voyager is made possible through the support of these organizations For additional information on the Music Voyager or the artists featured in this episode, visit us on the web at musicvoyager.com. <laughs>